Hello, everyone. My name is Caetano Miranda, the Director of Education and Diffusion of Knowledge of the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation, one of the uh, leading engineering uh, research centers of APESP. On behalf of our director, Professor Julio Meneghini, today I'm glad to introduce the RCGI Colloquia series, which happens weekly, bi-weekly, initially online and hopefully soon also in person on the RCGI headquarters in the University of Sao Paulo. Those colloquias uh, organize a series of public lectures uh, prepared for a broad audience by leading authorities on their fields and our promising young researchers with fresh and innovative scientific and technological ideas uh, across our research programs uh, on RCGI. The nature-based solution, uh, carbon capture and utilization, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, greenhouse gas, and the advocacy. The series also aims to promote the transversal and the multidisciplinary discussions among the RCGI's programs and members and bridge with the external public. Uh, on the issues that are the core of our CGI, the climate change, energy, sustainability, and how to manage, monitor, control, and transform greenhouse gases and bring innovative solutions towards a low carbon society. We are grateful for the general support of our, our founder support uh, sponsors, FAPESP and Shell, and also the technical support by Ana Paula Vasconcelos from our communication uh, team. So without, uh, without further delay, let me introduce the, our first ever speaker in the RCGI's colloquial series, Professor Paulo Artacho from the Institute of Physics in the University of Sao Paulo. Following the lecture, uh, we all have a, a question and answer session, and uh, we stimulate you to you to bring uh, your questions, comments along with the presentation with the chat. To summarize, uh, the Professor uh, Artacho career was quite challenging. Uh, professor Ch uh, Artacho is a professor of uh, environment physics at the University of Sao Paulo. He's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Science, uh, the TOAS, the World Academy of Science, and also the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he is also part of the, uh, the Sao Paulo Academy of Science and uh, he is one of the most cited scientists. So he is also part of the International Advers uh, Adversary Border of the RCGI and coordinates the project Greenhouse Gas Emissions in Amazon and uh, Data Analytics and Services System under the uh, Greenhouse Gas Program. This program aims to quantify the greenhouse gases sources and sinks in the Amazon and the drivers that control uh, the carbon balance with the focus on carbon dioxide and methane using data analytics and artificial intelligence. Today, we will learn a little bit more about, uh, uh, about it uh, with this lecture, with the, the whole of the Amazon forest and the absorption and the emission of greenhouse gases. Professor Tasha, please. Thank you, Caetano, for the introduction. So I will uh, share uh, my screen, uh, a window. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen, full screen. It's okay. Hello? Yes, Professor Tasha, you can read it. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry, my, some of my slides will be in Portuguese, but most in, in English, because just yesterday I learned that the seminar would be in English, but does not matter. So basically, I will discuss on this uh, discussion the role of Amazonia in the absorption and emission of greenhouse gases. It's a very complex issue, as I think you're going to learn along the presentation. First, let's take a picture of which are the issues in terms of main issues in terms of global climate change. Uh, that is from the latest IPCC report. So basically this, uh, this, let me get laser point here. This is the expected simulation change in the temperature. If you increase the global temperature by four degrees, that means the temperature in Brazil will be somewhat in, in the range of five to 5.5 uh, 
degree Celsius higher than before the Industrial Revolution. So this is a major change for an ecosystem functioning, in special for an ecosystem like uh, Amazonia, that evolved over the last 20, 30 million years in a very, very constant uh, uh, meteorological conditions. This change in temperatures also means change in precipitation. So basically, you see that Brazil as a whole will become a much drier region, especially in the central and northern part of Brazil, and that includes Amazonia. So how the forest will react to a reduction in 30% in precipitation and an increase in 5, 5.5 degrees centigrade. So that is one of the main questions we have to answer, and that is critical for Brazil and also for the global climate, uh, as I hope it will be very clear for you very soon. And then finally, the changes in soil humidity in, four, in, a, in a planet four degrees hotter than today, than pre-industrial values, means that look for the Amazonian situation. The change in terms of, um, of uh, precipitation and soil humidity means that the central part of Brazil and Amazonia will suffer a lot. So as Amazonia has about 120 teragrams of carbon uh, in the ecosystem, so this could start to release this carbon to the atmosphere, and that is a main issue for Brazil and for the global planet, like you're going to discuss along this uh, presentation. This is already happening in Brazil. So climate change is not anything for the future, is actually uh, the present situation here on the left, uh, you can see a paper published in 2016 already mentioning that the temperature anomaly for Amazonia uh, is about 2.2, 2.3 degrees hotter than a few decades ago. If you look here on the right, is precipitation anomaly. So basically look for the San Francisco Basin, is much drier than, than a few decades ago, and look for the whole Amazonia. So uh, it's already becoming a drier region. And of course, precipitation is increasing in the southern part of Brazil. So this means the Amazonian ecosystem is already changing. So how to uh, analyze the impact of these uh, climatological changes on the carbon uh, stocks uh, from the Amazon forest? This is one of the main issues we have in our RCGI project. And it's important to understand that Amazonian global <coughs> climate change is a two-way space. Deforestation in Amazonia impacts the global climate in a very significant way. Deforestation, global deforestation responsible for 17% of the greenhouse gases to the global atmosphere, but also global change, especially by the, by the burning of fossil fuel, also impact the Amazonian forest. So basically, uh, we have to study and quantify these feedback loops that are critical for the carbon stock in Amazonia and, of course, in all tropical forests. And it's important to understand that achieve what we mean by net zero by 2050 depends on the Earth's natural carbon sinks. So that's a very strong statement that actually how we're going to handle tropical, boreal, and temperate forests are critical to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. These are the carbon storage, for instance, for the boreal forest, where most of the carbon is stored in the soil, not on the vegetation itself. And this is for temperate forest, and this is for the tropical forest. So basically, tropical forest holds 120 billion tons of carbon in the ecosystem, plus 123 tons of carbon in the soil. So basically, you see that the where this carbon goes to is critical for global uh, change. 
and also especially the soil that is much less studied than the canopy of the Amazon forest also holds key questions that we're going to discuss later. And then uh, recently we published a, pay, a review paper analyzing the role of tropical forest, temperate forest and boreal forest in terms of moderating climate control. So how the, the climate controls in terms of uh, evaporative cooling, uh, radi absorption of radiation, carbon storage, how does these components changes for tropical forest, for boreal forest, and also for temperate forest. As we mentioned before, this is critical for uh, global climate change. This uh, movie shows how much carbon the plants fix from the atmosphere uh, uh, dynamically. Uh, this is winter time in the northern hemisphere. Now is summer time in the northern hemisphere, and so on. You see that the boreal forest oscillates between large carbon stocks and uh, losing that carbon to the atmosphere during winter time. But the tropical forest does not do that. Look for Amazonia; is green all the year long, as well as the tropical forest of Africa and also the tropical forests in Southeast Asia. So basically, this is uh, the a very dynamic system that could be changing because of the climate change. If you look now for more specifically for Amazonia, the uh, deforestation in Amazonia is a very, very recent uh, phenomena. So in 1975, when actually I started to do these studies uh, in the Institute of Physics, basically only 0.5% of Amazonia was deforested. In 1988, 5% was deforested, and now we have about 19% of the forest uh, deforested. So this has impacts in the ecosystem, like you're going to show uh, very soon. So the deforestation rate in Amazonia, as everybody knows, is going up uh, since the last seven, eight years. So now we are destroying about 11,000 square kilometer of primary forest every single year. And Brazil has committed during the COP26 to zeroing the deforestation rate by 2028 is only six years from now. And the question is, Brazil has to establish a monitoring system to follow up this procedure, have to establish public policies to achieve this target, uh, this commitment. So uh, that's not an easy task, and RCGI is critical to help on this uh, point. So Brazil is not only Brazil who loses a primary tropical forest. So this is a time series from 2002 to 2020. You see that during the dry years or El Nino years, you see a huge uh, impacts on the tropical forest, but you see that you are increasing the primary uh, forest loss. And which countries are responsible for that? mostly Brazil, Congo, and Indonesia. So these three countries are responsible for 85% of the total deforestation in the plant. And this is a good news, because if you can control uh, deforestation in only three countries from the 196 countries from the Climate Convention, we can get rid of 17% of greenhouse gas emission. That's a huge uh, amount of greenhouse gases. So basically, this is where uh, public policies should be driving to. In terms of Brazil, let's look for the Brazilian greenhouse gas emissions. So land use change is responsible for 46% of the Brazilian greenhouse gas emission in 2020. So is this green uh, bar here. So then you see that industry has very, very small emissions, 
but uh, agrobusiness is responsible for 28% of the emissions. So if you add, as we know that most of the land use change actually goes to pasture and plantations in Amazonia. So if you take care of the agrobusiness, so all this accounts for 73% uh associated with the agrobusiness in Brazil. So basically you see that and is increasing in the last five years. So that's a huge task for Brazil to actually revert these uh, uh, increases and at the same time producing food for a hungry uh, planet that will get even worse in the next few years. But the good news is that you can account not just the emissions of the greenhouse gases by deforestation, but also how much the, the, the forest that exists in Brazil removes CO2 from the atmosphere uh, using photosynthesis. That is the only large scale way to remove CO2 so far from the atmosphere that we know right now. There are a lot of new emerging technology, but photosynthesis right now is the way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So basically you see that the removals by the land use, by, by the trees that were not uh, getting down, and also the removals by secondary vegetation is a very significant fraction of the Brazil emissions. How this balance will change in the next few years is also important in, in global terms. So if you got the total emissions from Brazil, uh, 2,000 uh, megatons of CO2 equivalent, that includes here methane, the removal, it's about uh, one quarter of this value. So it's a very significant removal. So the question is how we can strengthen the removal process by secondary forest and by forest in protected areas to allow to sequester more CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. And Amazonia is critical for that. And the MAPI biomas system is absolutely an outstanding uh, product that analyzes the, uh, the changes in land use and land cover change from 1985 to 2020, where you see here the loss of forest, the increase in pasture area, and the increase in agricultural land. And you can also have geographically distribution of these um, uh, emissions uh, on a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer resolution all over Amazonia into the map bioma system. And we're going to use this system to help us to assess the impacts of Amazonia in terms of climate change. And it's important to understand that the, uh, the, the carbon cycling between the atmosphere, the soil, and the plant is a very complex process that we still do not fully understand. So basically you have the atmospheric CO2, the carbon that is fixed in the vegetation, the carbon that goes into the soil. Each one of these components has different uh, dynamics. And if you go into more details, so then also includes deforestation, includes respiration by all plants, by the soil, by bacteria from the soil, emissions of CO2 and also methane from soil microbes and so on. How much of this uh, global change process affect photosynthesis that depends on radiation, water vapor and nutrients? Uh, to be effective. And certainly we are changing the, the main ingredients of, of photosynthesis, changing all this uh, system that fix CO2 into the trees in Amazonia. And nobody talks too much about the soil. So basically soil is very, very critical for the carbon cycle. As you saw in the very beginning, in boreal forest, most of the carbon is actually stored on the soils, but also in tropical forest, the soil role 
is very important, together with evaporation, transpiration, CO2 uptake, precipitation, and the many complex systems. To understand this is the reason why we are developing this RCGI component of greenhouse gases in Amazonia. And it's important that many other aspects influence the terrestrial carbon cycle. That includes the chemistry of the atmosphere and the climate interactions on the way to precipitation, changes in radiation, atmospheric CO2 concentrations, ozone, uh, volatile organic compounds, aerosol particles, and many other factors. So we are trying to integrate all this component for the first time in a single platform. This is not a trivial task to do that with a 10 or 100 kilometers uh, spatial resolution for the last 25 years for Amazonia, but that is what we are aiming for on our RCGI project. So this is just a component, uh, um, uh, a picture that shows how uh, are the many different aspects that influence CO2 uh, uptake by the vegetation. It's not just photosynthesis, but it's ozone, secondary organic aerosol, clouds that are very important in this process, precipitation, changes in radiation, diffuse and direct radiation, and so on. And we want to quantify the feedback loops between all these different variables, because this was never done for tropical forest. And then this is very important because understanding the feedback loop, loops will help us to understand how close you are from a tipping point uh, in Amazonia. So uh, to help with this task, we have a very large number of satellites monitoring carbon cycle and all the variables that impact on the, on the carbon cycling. That is, includes aerosols, ozone, uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, and so on. So we are integrating many of these different satellite products in one single database that can be uh, easily accessible, it's uh, open access, and you, where you can develop tools like intelli artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, to really try to understand the complex uh, relationship between carbon cycle and uh, the whole planet. And this is just a snapshot of a single a set of satellites that NASA uh, operates. All these satellites pass over the same region within, let's say, one or two minutes, uh, measuring CO2, measuring water vapor, measuring ozone, measuring aerosols, clouds, and other chemical components. So basically, we're going to integrate in, in the same data set, the information from all these satellites in quasi real time. And then also on the ground, uh, we, are, we are running together with the INPI, uh, that's an important partner in our project, LIDAR systems to measure the density of the biomass of the Amazonia with a very high spatial resolution. So we'll fly a LIDAR in one aircraft that's fly over, the, over all the Amazonian region or at least at the critical part, quantifying how much kilograms per square meter of carbon is stored right now in Amazonia. And uh, Geometo from INPI, one of our partners in the project, produced this map with the distribution of, of the biomass in the forest. And you see that it varies by factor of four, depending on the region in Amazonia. And this is a very dynamic system, and this is changing uh, quite significant, as you're going to see uh, very soon. Another important impact is the impact of biomass burning on the carbon cycling. Uh, Alberto Setzer for, from INPI developed the system to monitor uh, fire counts that are these red spots here. And we are going to integrate these fire, uh, fire spots as well as the concentration of aerosols 
change in the surface albedo, change the radiation balance, and impact on the CO2 uptake by the forest itself. So you see that the biomass burning smoke impacts all over South America, not just the, uh, the Amazon region, and this has very important impact on the carbon balance of the forest. This is a, a network that my group operates in Amazonia for the last 22 years continuously that measure the aerosol optical depth, showing that during the dry season, we have extremely high aerosol loading, and during the wet season, we have a very clean uh, loading of particles in the atmosphere. So this is important because this uh, changes the ratio of diffuse to direct irradiation uh, that impacts photosynthesis in a very, very important way. This is uh, analyzed in this uh, modeling paper we published a few years ago, uh, uh, quantifying how much the change in diffuse radiation as we increase biomass burning uh, emissions, how much this impact in the net primary productivity, the amount of carbon that is absorbed by the ecosystem. And you see that the impact is very large. And now we are going to uh, continue with this kind of work, but with a much more complete data set uh, together with the MAP biomass uh, system. Another impact of deforestation is the change in the surface albedo. Surface albedo is the ratio of, of radiation that is reflected back to space, uh, and that is critical for the radiation balance, uh, also, of course, by the, uh, by the surface temperature. So uh, one student have calculated that the mean diurnal radiative forcing due to change of surface albedo in Amazonia is minus 80 watts per square meter. The increase in greenhouse gases is plus 2.3 watts per square meter. So actually, when you change the forest to a pasture area, you basically cool down the atmosphere significantly, and also you reduce the evapotranspiration. And water vapor is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas, so you also change the water vapor in addition to the surface albedo. So now we're going to continue this study with a much larger uh, data sets for the overall Amazonia. And then the drivers for Amazonian fires, in terms of type of fires, the positive and also negative feedbacks are also very important. So basically, from deforestation, pasture man, man, maintenance, agriculture that is happening in Amazonia region. Uh, we are going to analyze all these uh, different impacts on the carbon budget in Amazonia. Uh, just last week was published this very interesting uh, study that analyzed the effect of complete deforestation on global temperature. Look at this. This is very interesting because uh, in tropical region, uh, what we have is that most of the deforestation will bring a net heating to the global atmosphere. But the deforestation in the boreal forest will bring a cooling uh, because of the change in surface albedo and the changes in evap evapotranspiration. So basically, you see how complex are the interactions between forest and climate that you're going to clear some of these major questions for the tropical forest analyzing what is happening in Amazonia with the biogenic VOC emissions, changes in albedo, changes in evapotranspirations, and changes in CO2. And one of our laboratory in Amazonia is the Ato Tower. That is a tower that we are doing continuous measurement, tower of 325 meters height. It's not easy to go up by foot, so you have to be well fit. But it's a beautiful observatory that you are continually measuring a lot of different properties. Between all these properties, we are doing 
high precision CO2 measurements, so precision of 0.1 parts per million at least. And then you see less, a uh, few weeks ago, that is the diurnal variability in CO2 concentration. Uh, during the night, you have a respiration, so CO2 goes up. During the day, you have photosynthesis, CO2 goes down. And we wanted to understand better the dynamics of CO2. And we are also doing high precision methane emissions in Amazonia, uh, actually, for the first time continuously in the Ato Tower. In addition to that, we're also measuring isotopic ratios that are critically important to know where the CO2 and where this methane came from. Uh, methane from flooded areas, methane from leaves, methane from uh, soil emissions, all have slightly different isotopic ratios uh, signatures. So analyzing these components, we can help to know where these components are coming. And two weeks ago, I uh, was published this uh, paper uh, analyzing these CO2 records in, in the Ato Tower, actually separating how much of the CO2 came from the rivers, how much came from the tropical Atlantic Ocean, and how much came from the forest uh, uh, fossil fuel plus fires. So you see that, for example, the impact of the river emissions are not negligible in Amazonia, and we'll do some experience quantifying emissions from the very large fluvial network that we have uh, in Amazonia. And just yesterday, we also published a review article uh, the role of tropical and boreal forests in the atmospheric interactions. It's a very large review article, 163 pages, and actually is the very first page with the RCGI signature on it. So it will have uh, thousands of citations because it will be a landmark paper on the study of forest interactions with the climate. So now going back to the hydrological cycle in Amazonia. We have uh, indications that the hydrological cycle is uh, intensifying in the sense that, for, for instance, this is discharge of the Amazon River in Pará, in Obidus. So you see an increase in the amount of water that goes out uh, from the Amazon mounds. This could be uh, associated with the change in sea surface temperature, the, the surface, the, the sea surface is increasing uh, very fast, or can be associated with the change in the partitioning of water within the ecosystem. And what we also know that is very important for carbon balance is that the dry season length is increasing in Amazonia, a very significant. It already has increased by six days each decade. So if you get it 30, 40, or 50 uh, years, this is a significant change in the length of the dry season. Also, we are observing an increase in the climate extremes in Amazonia. If you look for the uh, re Amazon River in Manaus, you see that the, the flooded uh, period are getting higher. The dry period is getting lower in terms of precipitation. And the amplitude between uh, wet season and dry season is increasing. So basically, the increase in climate extremes also impacts the carbon budget. And it's important to, to know that there is a clear relationship between precipitation and above ground live biomass for the Amazon, for the Congo forest, and for Southeast Asia. So wetter areas have a larger amount of carbon. So if the Amazon becomes drier, so we will displace this curve here to lower amount of above ground live biomass. So this shows very clear that the carbon cycle and the hydrological cycle are very closely linked. And the latest IPCC report uh, mentioning that Amazonia could become a carbon source in the future. So this, the model simulations shows that as you warm the climate, 
basically the Amazon forest will start to lose the carbon at a rate of minus one kilograms of carbon per each square meter, per each grau Celsius that we increase in terms of temperature. So this is a result of modeling. So uh, how this uh, is this uh, related to something in reality? Uh, we can look into several ways for this issue. A recent paper published by NASA JPL showed the vapor pressure deficit are already reaching large areas of Amazonia, not just in the areas where you have deforestation, but also in Amazonian pristine areas. And this is associated with, the, with smaller uh, water vapor that goes out from the stomata when the CO2 goes in to do photosynthesis. So basically, this is a clear uh, message that something is changing in Amazonia. Also, we are observing a decline in carbon storage in Amazonia if you look to remote sensing measurements. So clearly, we see that uh, carbon, um, the net biomass changing is approaching zero, especially because of the increasing tree mortality. So this means that the climate extremes that are increasing in Amazonia are possibly increasing the mortality of the trees together with increasing temperature and decreasing precipitation affecting the carbon storage. Basically, this also uh, there is a paper published in Nature 2020 that also shows the same thing. So basically in Amazonia, we we'll see a decrease in the net carbon sink that actually is not observable in Africa forests. So the question is why this is happening in Amazonia, but is not happening in Africa. So this is our critical question that we will try to address. Another important papers uh, using remote sensing was published in Nature Climate Change shows that above biomass, uh, above the ground biomass is decreasing over large areas of Amazonia, not just because of deforestation, but mostly because of forest degradation because of this uh, phenomena we are talking about. And these uh, were remote sensing measurements, but in situ measurements from an IMP paper published recently shows that precipitation in Santarém are decreasing, temperature are increasing significantly, making some regions of Amazonia, instead of carbon sink, a carbon source. So basically with the in situ measurements, possibly Amazonia is already becoming a carbon source to the global atmosphere. Of course, we needed to have many other studies that use the different techniques to, to know for sure if this happens and to evaluate the extension of these uh, changes in Amazonia. And other, other uh, recent papers shows that the sensitivity of Amazonia to increase in global temperature is much higher than the African forest and the Southeast Asia forest. So when there is a threshold that is 32.2 degrees Celsius at the top of the canopy, where photosynthesis is start to not function properly or at least with the same efficiency than with the lower uh, temperature. And this, of course, we are not very far from this increasing canopy temperature in Amazonia. Another interesting paper shows that the climate models predict increasing variability of temperature in Amazonia. Because what's important is not just the constant increase in the average temperature, but how much is the variability for a forest that was evolved over the last million years uh, with a very stable climate. This is critical. And the models shows that uh, where most of the variability will increase will be in Amazonia. So this is another piece of this major puzzle that we will try to uh, discuss. And the number of days with the maximum temperature above 35 degrees 
in a 2.6 watts per square meter on a conservative scenario uh, is about 60 days per year. If you allow the global temperature to increase by 4 degrees, these 60 days will increase to about 150 to 200 days per year with the temperature above 35 degrees. If you join this information with the previous slide showing a threshold of 32.2 degrees, you know what we can expect in terms of impact for Amazonia. And a paper published last week also show a pronounced loss of Amazonian resilience since the early 2000s. So basically, the conclusions of the paper is that we find that more than three quarters of the Amazon rainforest has been losing resilience since the early 2000s, consistent with the approach to a critical transition. So the main question is, is the forest going to a transition to a savanna and lose all this carbon to the global atmosphere? So this is a scenario we have to avoid uh, as much as possible. And models show that it, this can actually happen. If you include, this is a paper uh, where Carlos Nobre is a co-author, showing that uh, the, the eastern part of Amazonia, actually, if you take in care the climate and the land use interactions together with the fires, will do not have the conditions to sustain uh, a, a, a tropical forest. So basically, the tipping point of the equilibrium between the forest and climate in Amazonia is a very, very important uh, issue, not just for Brazil, but global uh, climate. So the thresholds uh, in this paper from Carlos Nobre shows that the threshold could be uh, four degrees uh, Amazon warming or 40% of the total deforested areas. We are already 50% of this uh, four degrees and 50% of the 40% of total deforested area. So basically this is something that's a critical scientific question, how far we are from a tipping point in Amazonia. And just to finish, to be within my, my time slot, and the latest IPCC report released two, two weeks ago from the working group two, shows that uh, the interactions between climate change, the human society, and also the ecosystems, including biodiversity, is a very strongly interacting three component. And each one of them has uh, individual risks that have to be addressed. And if you act uh, with the necessary urgency to reduce the climatic risk and build up resilience, we have to work in a new equilibrium between the human systems, not just the natural ecosystem, but working together with the transitions in the ecosystems, including biodiversity and the future climate change, limiting as much as possible global warming. So, how to develop an integrated science, uh, putting together these three components is critical for uh, our future. And our future will be also be uh, tied to the fulfill of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, where uh, the actions against the global climate change is the ODS 13, but of course, many of the different ODS will not be fulfilled if you do not control climate change. So basically, climate change is one of the key factor controlling all the other 17 uh, ODS. And our uh, RCGI project uh, will build up uh, a, a data analyti analytics and services system analyzing all the complex and non-linear system of greenhouse gas emissions in the Amazon, putting together remote sensing observation, as I mentioned, tower in situ observations, not just from ATO, but all the uh, 
uh, LBA towers, together with the results from modeling that are very, very important, putting all this together with machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence tool to really understand better and to have a better constraint on carbon in Amazonia. That is the critical issue that we are trying to address on this project. It's also important to understand that this is not the only project of RCGI that will deal with this component. Also, there is another component coordinated by SERI, SERI on the solution, natural-based solutions that will try to look into the agro systems uh, and how to put the agro system in equilibrium with the forest. That's also a very, very important project uh, helping Brazil to fulfill the uh, NEDCs uh, of the Brazil government. So basically, I hope that uh, it's made it very clear in this presentation that Amazonia is key for global sustainability. Let's work together on, on, on good science and public policy to preserve as much of the forest because this uh, is critical uh, for the uh, global climate. So I will uh, stop here, uh, stopping the sharing my screen. Thank you for your attention. I will be ready to answer any questions or issues you may have. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Paul Artasha. It, it was a fascinating uh, lecture. And uh, we have some questions here from the chat. I, I actually, for my side, I, I, I have, questions here, but uh, let's first give it to the people that uh, uh, have included on our chat. I think the first one uh, is uh, from Professor So you're happy from Professor Reinaldo Silva. Uh, do you believe that uh, the research on the Amazon preservation can fit the sustainable development in the Amazon? or in the other forests? Uh, of course, Reinaldo. We all know that science is not the only ingredient to, that works on this complex equation, driving uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Public policies are important, and public policy needs to be uh, uh, well-funded in terms of science. So science is critical for the success of public policy. But decisions on how to preserve the Amazon, on how to reduce uh, emissions are not with the scientists. Of course, these are our governments, and we hope that with the good science, with, and then making this science accessible easily by the global population, we will make pressure for the governments actually to uh, implement policies to reduce, not just deforestation in Amazonia, but also to build up a more sustainable society. That is exactly what we need. And it's the only way we can see any future that could worse uh, the world as a future for humanity. So we are all working on this direction, uh, doing good science, uh, making this science available to the global, publicly and making pressure on politicians to implement good and science-based policies. So, Professor, before I move it to the next question, based on your answer now, um, so you have monitored the Amazon over the 22 years, as you mentioned, uh, looking for a perspective over these years. So what would be the uh, advices on the, uh, on the so-called public policies that you mentioned that uh, could balance this uh, forest preservation together with a, a sustainable economy? A very good question. First, uh, Brazil can... Re First, most important, there is no cheaper, faster, an easier way to reduce emission than reducing deforestation. That is very, very easy. So it costs almost nothing, can be done, in a matter of three, five, or six years, easily. And Brazil has all the technology and laws to do that. The problem is to make the laws actually 
applicable for the Amazon to have a judiciary system that, uh, because everybody knows that 95% of the Amazonian deforestation is associated with illegal activities in Amazonia. So this has, we needed to have a government that actually implement policies according to the Brazilian law. We have very good laws. We know how to reduce deforestation easily. And this can be done by 2028 as Brazil have signed a, a commitment to do that at COP26. So in terms of science, we have to set up a system like this one we are doing in RCGI actually to follow up on this process. Is the policies actually working? Which are the policies that are more effective? They are very different. They could have different uh, impacts, aspects, and so on. So we need the science to help and support public policies to do it uh, properly. And we will do it because the pressure from governments, both Brazilian and outside Brazil from the global population is increasing as much as possible. And I think we will do it and we, have, we could have a very different planet in, let's say, 20, 30 or 40 years from now. Thank you. Well, you have a question from Professor Julio Meneghini. So what is your opinion about the new technologies to improve the CO2 sequestration in the soil such as the use of hydrogels or with uh, oxalic, uh, oxalic acid and other operative yeah. options. It's important to understand that there is not a single solution for such a complex problem as uh, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Actually, we have to invest in many, as many as possible, different solutions. We don't know which one will be more effective. And the solutions are very much country dependence, are very much region dependence. You know, for instance, planting tree, planting one tree in Amazonia or in Finland, you know, you have a completely different carbon uh, absorption from this uh, the, from these two ecosystem and the same with the carbon in soil you saw in my first present in my first slide that the soil is where most of the carbon is stored so if you find ways to keep more carbon in the soil or to use the uh, ag uh, agricultural practice to increase the carbon uptake by soil bacteria and microorganisms will be absolutely uh, strategic for us. So basically, Julio, we have to work on all possible uh, strategies. That includes reducing deforestation, increasing carbon stocks in the soil, that's also important for agriculture, and all the unreducing greenhouse gas emissions to, uh, to the burning of fossil fuel. So this is a one uh, curiosity for my side. So your multi-scale approach goes from the nano, the molecular scale, up to the planetary scale. So where do you see as the major challenges on your project? Is to access the information? Is the methodological issues? Is how to integrate uh, all, all those scales? Could you comment on that? Yes, the project is very risky. What I what I can what I'm seeing this, you know, uh, it it has never been tried to put together, let's say, 30 years of land use change from map biomas with the the gigantic amount of information that we get from satellites, from ground-based experiments in several towers, meteorological observations, and so on, in a single platform to better understand the relationship between forest degradation, deforestation, between global climate change and impact on the carbon stocks in Amazonia. This has never been done before. So in this sense, the project is very innovative, but it's a very, very difficult task. You know, It's a non-linear, complex system. We don't know all the relationship between the chemistry of the atmosphere, the biology of the forest and the soil, and the physics of climate, how much this will change in terms of clouds, precipitation, radiation balance, and so on. To put all this in a single platform and making these things work 
is not a trivial task and it's very risky. We have to assume this risk, you know, because innovative science always uh, show up when you take a large risk and will not be easy. But of course, if we don't believe that we can do it, we never would propose this for our CGI. So we'll do it. I hope in, the, in two or three years, I came back here, give another seminar, uh, clearing out all these points that I made along my presentation. And I think we'll do it. Yes, yeah, thank you so much again, Professor Atasho. So uh, maybe is a, a last question from also from my side. Um, how do you see the public perception on the Amazon population? I mean, because here you are trying to monitor uh, for several perspectives from the scientific perspective, but also on this project you have is this uh, also this ingredient that is the, the the Amazon population itself that are going to. Uh, yeah. have the, the implications and the impact of... Uh... Yeah, the social dynamics of the Amazonia is really, really the most difficult thing because, of course, the behavior of people is very difficult to predict, you know, but uh, without them, forget about it. We have 20 million people living in Amazonia. So how to provide it? To, to these 20 million people, you know, a decent level of life without uh, deforestation. It's not a very easy question to do. FAPESP is starting a new project, it's called the Amazonian Initiative, you know, that will be very large, will be launched the first edital on June 5 uh, in Manaus. So it will be an international project together with the FAPs from all the Amazon region and FAPESP trying to answer your question, Caetano, you know, how the socioeconomic system uh, can be, uh, let's say, changed in a way, in a sustainable way, preserving the forest, how the biosocial uh, economics could be developed for a sustainable Amazonia. It is not very, very easy uh, to answer this question. So we have uh, a call for proposals trying to answer specifically this question that we do not have the answer so far. And uh, to finalize, uh, uh, I want to take uh, the last question by Karen, as Karen asked. So do you think that uh, society supports forest preservation? And uh, how do you think society can push for the, the government and the other stakeholders to take actions uh, towards the forest preservation? Karen, yes. This Brazilian societies strongly support forest preservation. Uh, during the COP26, there were several pools uh, from the Brazilian general population that shows that 85% of the Brazilian population is against destroying the Amazon forest. It's a very strong uh, uh, population fraction that uh, are against the policies from the government right now. So, in addition to the international pressure that are increasing significantly and the Brazilian uh, population itself, so this will make it very difficult for the next government not change uh, completely, actually, you know, the direction of development of Amazonia from uh, uh, destroying the forest and not bringing any real... Let's never forget that the worst... Uh, human development index in Brazil are actually in the Amazon region. You know, it's a very poor region. So who is profiting from all the destruction of 20% of the forest are not the local population. And the local population is, uh, is looking for that very carefully. And we have to engage the local population on these uh, scientific movements in to build up a new biosocial economy that could be sustainable for Amazonia. And this is critically important to achieve net deforestation of zero, as well as build up a sustainable society in Amazonia. Nobody knows exactly how to do that. You know, nobody have a recipe. Okay, let's implement this and this and this. This will have to build up in the next few years, 
by science population, the judiciary system, and the government from the states, from the municipalities, as well as with the federal government. It will not be easy to make all these components work together, but it's the only way that we can have a consensus on how to develop in a sustainable way the population in Amazonia. And without them, this uh, certainly cannot be done. Yeah, if you can take uh, one more question, Professor. So yeah. you have found the Ani Rossi. Uh, can carbon isotope techniques distinguish between carbon coming from burning in natural cycles? Yes. Yes, that is exactly the reason why we are doing carbon isotopic ratio measurements in Amazonia. We are measuring carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, as well as in CO2 and in methane. So basically with this, uh, you can apportion where particular components of carbon I came from. How much carbon is coming from developed countries from the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, I show you one paper that shows the carbon came from the ocean. So is, if you is more interested on that, I can send, send me an email. I can send you this paper that shows the methodology that you are using at ATO to actually apportion how much carbon and methane are coming from each of these different reservoirs. And then uh, this year, we are bringing a German aircraft and also we will do a boat expedition to the western part of Amazonia, designed specifically to measure carbon isotopes. So you have a much, much better feeling of where the carbon that we're measuring the atmosphere are coming from. So this is absolutely interesting from the scientific point of view. It's a difficult task, it's not trivial, but you are showing the, the very first paper uh, was released a few days ago uh, that this is possible and this uh, will be strengthened over the next few years. Well, thanks, thanks again. I think it was a great pleasure to have you as a, our first speaker in the uh, ACGI colloquial series. And with that, uh, I'd like also to thank the audience and uh, hope to see you in two weeks from now. Thank you very much.